This week on Christian World News, Putin's patriarch, how the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church is backing Russia's war on Ukraine. Plus, faith in the wilderness, how the testimony of China's persecuted house churches can help Western Christians learn to be faithful in suffering. And a popular Christian singer says he no longer believes in the Christian God. And he's not the only one who's leaving the faith. See what's behind the mass exodus of millennials. Welcome to Christian World News. I'm Gary Lane. A holy mission. That's how the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church is describing Vladimir Putin's brutal war on Ukraine. He also supports Putin's vision of uniting the whole Russian-speaking world under Moscow's control. CBN's Dale Hurd explains. It might surprise many in the West to learn that Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine has the enthusiastic support of the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church, Patriarch Kirill. A close ally of Putin, Kirill continues to preach that Russian believers should support the war in Ukraine as a holy mission. This dates back around 10 years ago at the beginning of Putin's third term. Patriarch Kirill, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church, um, began working in tandem with Putin, it kind of having the Russian Orthodox Church operate as a form of soft power for Putin in the region. Earlier this month, Kirill delivered a sermon to Russian military leaders in a cathedral dedicated to Russia's armed forces. According to a report from Religion Dispatches, the patriarch referred to a version of history that sees no distinction between Russia and Ukraine, essentially not recognizing Ukraine's existence as an independent nation and did not even recognize Ukrainians as a separate people by referring to all involved in the conflict as holy Russians. Kirill has preached that it is God's truth that the people of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus should be reunited as one spiritual people. This is Putin's doctrine of Ruski Mir, or Russian world, which holds that ancient Russia must be reunited and Moscow has the right to dominate its neighbors. Kirill started preaching a ideology, this idea of a Russian world, or particularly a holy roots, this sort of transnational Russian sphere of civilization that included Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and some other parts of Eastern Europe, um, and where the idea would be that Moscow was the political center. And while Vladimir Putin was a Soviet KGB agent, records from the Cold War revealed Patriarch Kirill was a KGB spy during Soviet times. Kirill has described Putin's leadership of Russia as a religious miracle. While Putin critic Mikhail Khodorkovsky says Putin sees for himself a prospect of being kind of a messiah, a person who unites the whole Russian-speaking world. And for Patriarch Kirill, Vladimir Putin is God's instrument to fight against the decadent West. Dale Hurd, CBN News. The tiny country of Armenia has become a new hotspot for refugees fleeing the effects of the war in Ukraine. But these refugees aren't Ukrainian. They're arriving from Russia. CBN contributor Chuck Holden talked to some of them to find out why. It's springtime in Armenia, and the cherry blossoms have arrived around the capital city, Yerevan. And that's not all that's breaking out here. More than 120,000 Russians have come here since the war began in Ukraine, with more arriving each day. This sudden influx, however, is causing challenges for Armenians as well. Well, my fiancé and I have been looking for an apartment, and the prices have gone up more than twice, and it's almost impossible to find an apartment in Yerevan. Everywhere, the prices have gone up, like, dramatically. This former Soviet satellite state is one of the few places left where Russians can travel, and up to 40 flights arrive here from Russia every day. Many of the passengers don't plan on going home anytime soon. There are Russians all over here in downtown Yerevan, and I've been talking to many of them. It seems like most of them are young professionals, IT people, things like that, people who do their work online, and that's something that you really can't do right now in Russia because of the sanctions. Also, everybody that I've spoken to has been vehemently against this war, but there's a catch. They don't want to go on camera and talk about it. That says a lot about how much they fear their own government, because most of them still have families back in Russia. 
Eventually, we found these two young Russians willing to speak out on camera. Can you tell me why you left Russia? Yeah, because of the war and uh, the Putin dictatorship. So we decided to move, like my friends moved to Armenia and I moved to Georgia. And we we'll probably won't come back until the government overthrown, but I won't be putting my money on it. But hopefully, someday, maybe. How do you feel about the war in Ukraine? I'll ask you. That's awful uh, because uh, this is illegal war uh, and uh, now Putin makes a lot of war crimes in Ukraine. So uh, <laughs> I'm not agree with the politics of my country. And uh, it's kind of strange feeling when uh, your country goes to war, but you want that your country lose it. Even if the war ends and like Russia loses, I don't see myself living comfortably in a country where like uh, the country leader is almost like a Hitler. Mm -hmm. And like the absolutely militaristic state of the government right now is awful. So far, Armenia has avoided taking a political stand on the war, even though most are horrified at the images coming out of Ukraine. Um, I think because um, Ukraine's government supported Azerbaijan during the war uh, in Artsakh, um, Armenians feel hurt and uh, they don't really want, they, they did not really want to support Ukraine. But after, you know, seeing what was happening in Ukraine, of course we felt bad for the people. Um, and we are trying to be supportive and we're trying to be open not only to Russians in Armenia, but also to Ukrainians. Uh, Armenians are great with Russians. They totally understand the situation because uh, there was a war in Armenia some time ago. So they are super friendly and I like this country very much. Thousands of Ukrainian refugees have landed here as well, which makes for an interesting dynamic in the coffee shops around Yerevan, where refugees from both sides rub shoulders. Still, this Armenian pastor says there's a bright side to this crisis. They are in a desperate situation. Some of them are depressed and they don't hope they don't have hope to go back to Russia. So they are looking forward to stay here for a long time. So this is a good, good, very good opportunity for us. From Yerevan, Armenia, I'm Chuck Holt for CBN News. Coming up, China's house churches are persecuted and marginalized. So what can we learn from these suffering Christians? A new book explores the value of faith in the wilderness. Hannah Nation is managing director for the Center of House Church Theology and content director for China Partnership. She's also co-editor of the book Faith in the Wilderness, words of exhortation from the Chinese church, which offers insights from persecuted believers into the faithfulness and hope in Christ in the midst of trouble. She joins us now for more. Hannah, tell us how this book came about. What led to its creation? So in early 2020, there was a conference of Asian believers that took place in Malaysia. There was a large delegation from the Chinese house churches. And um, unfortunately, as it happened, the conference coincided with um, the Wuhan lockdown and the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And a lot of the Chinese couldn't leave China as a result. Um, and so they decided to live stream um, this conference into China, which was involved a significant risk for many. Um, but there were tens of thousands of um, viewers who watched. And so after the conference concluded, they decided to continue doing public live stream evangelistic preaching, um, they felt like um, pandemic was an important time for evangelism. And so um, groups of pastors preached openly, publicly um, throughout 2020, calling people to Jesus in the midst of the pandemic. And um, the content from this book was developed from those sermons. So it's a message of hopefulness for those who are experiencing suffering. The motto that these pastors carried with them throughout this preaching um, was let the light shine in the darkness. And I think that motto com really comes out in the book. So are there any testimonies that really encouraged you? I know many of the pastors who are represented in the book. Um, they are themselves experiencing um, harassment 
So, I mean, just even their, their willingness to look beyond themselves to the needs of their communities and the needs of the, their neighbors to hear about Jesus um, at risk to themselves is a powerful testimony. One pastor reflects on the experience of losing a child. Um, another pastor reflects on the experience of, of bitter fights with his wife. Um, and so they're very relatable, even though these stories come from China, which might feel very far away. They're very human. And we in the West always think that we have a lot to teach the Chinese church or other churches, but really we can learn a lot from them. So what do you hope Western leaders will take away from this book? Well, as you mentioned, the church in China has grown just massively in the last 80 years. Um, estimates, conservative estimates are that there are 70 to 80 million Christians in China today. Since 1950, that's about a 60-fold growth um, in Christians in China. So obviously there's been massive revival. And I think for me, one of the big takeaways is that this is a a church without power. This is a church on the cultural margins. And yet they are seeing this significant revival. So I think for us, um, it's a word of encouragement to us that um, we don't need to be afraid of what lies ahead in our own countries. Um, we don't need to fear um, cultural attack or cultural marginalization because Christ is with his church. And I can't let you leave without asking you about Pastor Wang Yi, the leader of the Early Rain Covenant Church. Uh, he's been in prison for more than three years now, and you know that he had a manifesto for house churches. What can you tell us about him? Well, um, it's not easy to find a lot of information about him. Um, we believe that he is well. We anticipate the day that he's released. The Center for House Church Theology is will be publishing a book of his writings later this year um, around the anniversary of his arrest um, so that they can not only know his the story of his arrest and the persecution of early reign, but understand um, his motivations and what he believes about God. Yes, an anniversary coming up in December, and he was charged, like many house church leaders, with sedition and incitement against the state. So thank, thank you, you, Hannah Nation, for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Hannah's book is called Faith in the Wilderness, and you can find it wherever books are sold. We'll be right back. And up next, more and more millennials are leaving Christianity. We'll show you what's behind this mass exodus and how the church can help them keep their faith. Welcome back to Christian World News. The number of Americans with a confident belief in God is dropping. Accordingly to recently released numbers from the General Social Survey in 2021, just under 50% of Americans agreed with the statement, I know God really exists. And I have no doubts about it. That's down from 57% in 2016. Among people 18 to 34, those who have no doubt in the existence of God dropped from 64% in 1993 to 38% last year. Organized religion, daily prayer, church attendance, and the number of people who identify themselves as Christians are all on the decline. This trend includes the rise of the group known as religious nuns, people with no religious affiliation. CBN's De uh, Brody Carter explores why so many Christians are leaving the faith, what's being done to bring them back. If you want to know how far my love can go, just how deep, just how wide. John Steingard's faith journey reflects America's changing religious landscape. Once part of a Christian band, He's joined a burgeoning group that blurs the traditional lines of religious identification. I definitely don't think I literally believe in the God that most Christians would say that they believe in, but I'm not so convinced that Christian faith and practices is always a harmful thing. And he's not alone. Study after study shows Christianity is not the force it once was. That data haunts me. In 2021, Pew Research found self-identified Christians making up 63% of the U.S. population, a drop from 75% just 10 years ago. 
The majority of this decline is happening among Protestants, dropping 10 points in the last decade, while Catholicism remains relatively unchanged. During the same period, the group called religious nuns has steadily grown. When we ask people about their religious identification, are you Protestant, Catholic, Mormon, Orthodox Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, atheist, agnostic, something else or nothing in particular, the religious nuns are those people who answer that question by describing themselves as atheist or agnostic or as simply nothing in particular. In studying the secular shift, researcher Gregory Smith says he sees no sign of this trend slowing down. Religious nuns currently account for about three in 10 U.S. adults. That's, you know, triple, perhaps even getting close to quadruple the share who said that about three decades ago. Other indicators that Americans are growing less religious include prayer. Fewer than half of adults do so daily. 30% say they pray seldomly or not at all. Still, 4 in 10 say they consider religion to be very important in their lives. So many of these people we had, they grew up in our children's ministries. They grew up in our youth groups. Somehow we missed them, man. We were unable to get them ready to, to live in the world that their life is playing out in now. Renowned pastor, author, and church planter Matt Chandler says the church must see and accept this harsh reality before it can move forward. You've got the kingdom of God and, and you've got the kingdom of darkness. And, and really, I, I think what you're seeing is there, there was, I think, a collapse of robust discipleship uh, for an extended period of time. To better understand the reasons why someone would leave their faith, I talked with Steingart, former lead singer for Hawk Nelson, a Canadian Christian rock band. Anybody that leaves any religious community, they have to figure out how to sort of hold themselves together and also how to make their way in the world. And that's actually not so easy. Steingart, whose father and father-in-law are both pastors, announced his decision on Instagram at the height of the pandemic. His announcement sent shockwaves through the Christian community. People like myself who decide to leave a faith tradition tend to be very focused on the negative aspects of that tradition when we leave, right? You know, like we, we tend to want to point out all the things that we think uh, are, are harmful or, or unfair or, you know, unjust. Steingard believes three major reasons people are currently leaving the church include differing beliefs on gay rights, failed support for social justice issues, and political platforms using faith to advance certain polarizing agendas. The church has to own that we really dropped the ball on discipling men and women for the world that they live in. Even the million or so kids that have left our church present a stunning opportunity for uh, innovation around evangelism, around reaching our neighbor. Chandler sees the rise of religious nuns as an opportunity to sow seeds of hope through his church planting ministry. To encourage support, he plans to fund each new church planter who partners with the Acts 29 network, up to $50,000. Today, the network supports over 700 churches in 50 countries. I don't know what, who's watching this, what their heartbeat would be, but where you have a healthy local church made up of people who love Jesus Christ and, and know his word, darkness gets pushed back in a thousand different directions. It's not one big church that actually... Um, threatens the gates of hell. It's a thousand little lights in the darkness that kind of make up the brightness and the heat of the gospel. And so I want to be about pouring into that and giving my influence towards that, giving my time and energy and money towards that. Chandler and others remain undaunted by America's religious realignment. They still see fertile ground for outreach to nuns and others and for growth among professing believers through genuine Christian discipleship. Brody Carter, CBN News. More than four and a half million Ukrainians have fled the assault on their country. Neighboring Poland has taken in more than half of those refugees, where towns along the border are opening their arms to help. CBN's Wendy Griffith reports from Poland. While one neighboring country tries to take these Ukrainians' homeland by force, Poland is opening its arms to those escaping the terror. Here in the border town of Chemish, many refugees are finding comfort and shelter in the local church. Since the war began some six weeks ago, Pastor Cheswaf of the Nazareth Church has seen hundreds of refugees pass through his doors. 
Wcześniej tak nie czułem, ale... We weren't tak prepared, uh, it's just the need of appears, so I believe that God prepared us anyway, and we see the big need, so we respond to the needs. Several areas, including the main sanctuary, now serve as bedrooms for displaced families, while this spacious kitchen, equipped with a cappuccino maker, provides refugees like Anya and her 12-year-old daughter a small reminder of home. We have cold water, we have separate rooms, we have bedrooms. Uh, people are very nice. Anya and her daughter left eastern Ukraine three weeks ago at the urging of her husband, who stayed behind to fight. They're living here until they get their visas to England. We are in constant uh, contact with our friends from Kharkiv, and uh, they couldn't get out of the out of the car Kharkiv because it was constant bombing, and they were like uh, shooting even cars were who were trying to leave. Here at the Operation Blessing Tent, many more come through to receive hot drinks, blankets, and enjoy a place for their children to play. If they have nowhere to go, that's where OB and Pastor Cheswaf work together. Several occasions we made a phone call to this pastor and he showed up not even like 40 minutes later with his van and with his team to bring people to the church where they could spend the night. And he's very, very helpful and accommodating and, and the, the church is turned into a refugee center as you as you've seen. OB also provides them with hygiene kits and other relief items. Anya, a Polish native working with Operation Blessing, says helping these people is what Jesus would do. Can you imagine if Jesus crossing the border, what would you do, yeah? Would you do everything what you can to invite him, to feed him, to keep him warm, to give him clothes if he needs, and help him, yeah, and love him, yes, because he loves us so much that we should share this love with other people. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, on the Polish-Ukrainian border. Please continue to pray for Ukraine and for Russia, and also for CBN News employees, our teams uh, working in Ukraine and the border area of Poland. Thank you for joining us this week. We appreciate you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.